think we may we start now then. Um, thanks very much for everyone and, and a very warm welcome, uh, warm in the sense of the weather and a warm welcome to, to see you joining us uh, this evening. Um, this is, I think, uh, our third Instagram live uh, event. And uh, please uh, bear with me, certainly as your host um, over the next 20 to 25 minutes. Um, this is a relatively new world for me, uh, as well as lots of people adapting to different ways of technology. Um, but as I said a few minutes ago, uh, we're discussing a, a, obviously a very important uh, topic uh, this evening, which is men's minds matter um, in education. And um, I'll introduce Mike in a second. Um, but what I thought I would do initially is introduce uh, myself. So I, I'm Anthony Priest. Um, I'm, I, I'm a teacher, um, but certainly over recent years, work in the field of mental health and well-being. Um, and that spanned uh, through a number of different roles, but uh, certainly over the last few, few years is working with schools um, to uh, look at supporting staff, mental health and well-being. My role at Education Support um, is to work with um, a number of Welsh schools through um, a funded programme by Welsh Government. And that involves uh, lots of different, um, different avenues of the work, but working directly with schools, but also delivering workshops and training uh, for schools up and down uh, the lovely parts of, of Wales as well. This Instagram Live comes from Education Support, and um, Education Support is the only UK charity dedicated to supporting everybody that works in the education sector, um, especially um, focusing on mental health and well-being of staff in the sector. We, we know that probably there's um, a few football games going on uh, at the moment, uh, and there's certainly one tonight. Um, from our home nation. Um, so this session will be recorded and shared um, after this evening. So you can pick this up um, uh, sort of at your own leisure after, after the next sort of half hour or so. Before I introduce our excellent uh, guest, uh, Mike, shortly, I wanted to remind you the theme of today's Insta Live. Um, as I mentioned, Men's Minds Matter. Uh, and why? Um, it's actually men's health week uh, this week and that spans between the 14th and the 20th uh, of of june and this year's theme focuses on um the five ways to well-being um some of you that are tuning in might be familiar with this um but it is five different pillars of well-being that evidence shows that can support individual well-being and lots of schools and educators are embedding this into uh, their school practices to promote mental health and well-being across the school community. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mike Armature to um, just do a, a, a quick introduction for us this evening and also maybe why this, import, uh, this topic is important to, to you, Mike. Hi everyone, it's really good to be with you all tonight. Um, my name is Mike Armature. I do lots of things across um, both education and health. So I'm uh, responsible for uh, multiple different um, uh, external provisions and also um, for um, alternative provisions across a, a 12 school trust. I also work as an advisor for, for mental health and wellbeing and also trauma um, to lots of different schools, but I also work within mental health services um, and uh, formerly leader myself and uh, working in many different provisions. So I'm not somebody who's uh, far removed from the challenges that we're all facing at the moment. This is a, uh, my daily life as well um in terms of you know both supporting staff and um, directly and being in charge of well-being in different settings and similarly you know putting training and support in as well so lots of different things to to think about tonight and uh, i'm just delighted to to be with everyone thanks mike um yes myself and mike have worked uh, together and i know the impact that mike's work does make to educate us right up and down the country. So I'm really pleased to be joined by Mike this evening and thanks very much uh, for joining us. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna jump into a couple of questions really um, on the topic of, of men's mental health. And the first uh, question, um, we, we know that research tells us, um, especially from mine's recent research, uh, Get It Off Your Chest, that since 2009, um, 
men are more likely to access mental health support, but we know we still have uh, quite a way to, to go um, in this journey. But we are probably aware that in education, uh, it appears less likely that male members of staff um, that experience mental health problems do reach out for support. Um, and I was just wondering whether you have any thoughts on that, Mike, um, why this, this may be and where we still need to work, go with this uh, awareness and work as we move forward. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and, thank, and thank you for that, Anthony. Um, I think quite often one of the problems that we have within education is that we are um, expected to be these, you know, all things to everybody. And yet reflective practice and um, reflective support isn't necessarily built into our profession. So there's lots of discussions around whether or not supervision should be in place and all of those different things. But I don't tend to think of it as supervision. I tend to think about it actually as, as more reflection. And that reflection might be in terms of sort of one-to-one -one support with, you know, with line managers or, or peers. But it might also be, you know, as colleagues too. So I think that the problem that we have often with education is not necessarily a gender issue, but just as, as an equity issue and a quality issue is that we don't have that reflective support built into our profession like others do. So I think that's one particular problem to start with that isn't necessarily linked to gender. Linked more to gender, I would say that quite often um, when we start to think about the, the sort of um, classic gender roles that play out within education, um, typically it used to be the case that the majority of primary based educators were more female, the, the majority of um, secondary based educators were more, um, were more male. And that would be historically, of course, the, the types of roles that we would expect people to pop up in. However, that, that's no longer the case. And I think what has happened is that there's been a real shift in um, blended provisions in terms of gender, which is a great thing and really, really important. But I think what has happened is that there's been a real um, focus on men historically always moving towards leadership. There's always been this big focus on that men are natural sort of leaders. Um, and I've always found that quite perplexing because, I mean, not just because, you know, I think, you know, men and women equally bake, you know, and make uh, fantastic leaders, but... I think actually a lot of the time there is a real lack of emphasis on people who want to stay in the classroom or want to stay in their roles and work their way up and be experts in that area. Um, I think there's a real lack of emphasis on that within education and that's concerning because those those positions are very, very um, skilled and, and essential for the mechanism of, of our day-to-day -day support within schools and, and our office. So I find that quite strange and I think that particularly um, can sometimes hit men, you know, as, as equally as women. The other thing that I was thinking about just, just before we came on was that I had a discussion just the other day with um, a couple of male colleagues in, in a provision. And, and one of the things that um, was really interesting was when they were talking about incident management. So in some environments, obviously in schools, I predominantly work in AP and inclusive mainstreams where there are, you know, multiple incidents with students' behaviours, lots of different things. When it comes to incident management, men are a lot of the time within provisions seen and look to to be the people to deal with it. Now, I'm not saying that's the case for every provision whatsoever, but I'm saying when it comes to levels of, you know, potential need for physicality or when it becomes need for authority and all of those things in relation to an incident, it's very interesting that many colleagues in some of those provisions I was working with were automatically looking to those men because of, you know, stature, physicality, all of those different things. So it's really interesting how it plays out in certain scenarios as well. It's not necessarily just sort of day to day. There are certain moments and certain times within the provision, how it operates, where that assumption is there. Um, you know, so it's really interesting when you start to break down the mechanics of, of what we see day to day, um, how, how it might be quite gendered in certain ways. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, I'd say, but when it comes to reaching out, um, and, and, and men seeking support. I think in particular, some of those things aren't helpful in terms of historic interpretations of gender roles within school. And I, and I also think that what, one of the assumptions that people make is that men aren't looking for deep or reflective conversations. And I think that's a big, I think that's a big mistake because actually the majority of people that I know that are inside the profession crave those conversations it's just that they've not necessarily had the experience of it because people have always assumed that they don't need it so i think that assumption can be quite dangerous and quite uh, quite difficult and leads to a lack of you know men coming forward and because they haven't had the experience of what it would be like 
So we need to build those experiences in, I think, a lot earlier on so that when it comes to the fact that men do need to have that conversation with somebody based on what they're feeling, then, then it means that they have an experience to fall back on and something they can maybe replicate again with somebody else. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, definitely. I think there's, yeah, there's some excellent points there, Mike, well made. Um, you know, I see it through quite a bit of my work at the moment where we, we talk to schools around, you know, peer support and, and, and supervision and providing that sort of reflective space and talking space for um, people in our schools. And, and, and we, we, you know, we know that that is very, very helpful when that is taken on really and that sort of approach is taken on um, and the feedback is fantastic but we have a way to go in order to make this a normal part of our operation in schools that we do have time for reflection and peer support and be able to talk through things and maybe um, be proactive in some of those approaches that left you know sort of festering for a period of time uh, might come mm. to a point that we we are really reaching out for you know some support for our mental health and well-being so yeah, I think there's some some excellent points made there, Mike. And that, that leads into my another question I had for you, and I know that um, you brought it up there. But we we do tend to think that you know men in schools or men in in education, um, the in senior leadership roles, we do see a lot of male um, male um, sex basically, um, but also a lot of those roles. Do we think that males have you know a feeling they have to appear mentally strong in front of their staff then so if we have you know um senior leaders that are males that they have to feel you know uh, show that they're mentally strong and be able to cope with anything i mean do you have any experience of that working with teams in your work mike yeah quite a lot and i think it's I wouldn't say it's necessarily just a male issue. I think it's definitely across genders that this notion of, of needing to be strong. But I think, you know, when we start to unpick things, of course, what we realise is that, you know, that strength is is the categorization of it being strength to not show emotion is an interesting one for me because the strongest leaders I've known have been ones that have openly shown that emotion, mm. being solid, being, you know, inspirational, all of those things, but still not being afraid to show that. Now, you know, when we talk about showing emotion, I'm not saying that they walked around the corridors crying their eyes out. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But they showed appropriate emotion at the appropriate moments and the right times. And so, you know, the people that I most admire in leadership are those people that could do both. They could lead really well. They could inspire a team. Um, they, you know, they walk the walk, talk the talk, all of those things. But similarly, they weren't afraid to have discussions around vulnerabilities and all of those things. So I think that notion of, of, of mental toughness or, or, or strength is is a real interesting one that we need to move away from. Now, that's easily said from me, you know, sitting here today saying, well, you know, we need to move away from it. But the reality is when, when you're on the ground and you're having guidance thrown at you nine times out of 10, um, you know, late at night and you're having to adapt things in the morning, you know, very early on, you've got school community that you've got to communicate with. Um, you've got staff that you've got to, you know, keep going strategically with and support that strategic working as well as answer to stakeholders. Uh, you know, it's it's a multifaceted role, whatever leadership role you're in. The reality is, is that there is sometimes that necessity to project strength and to and to say, you know, I've got this, it's okay, and it's necessary. So I, I think that in terms of in terms of leadership and mental health there, one of the biggest things that that I advocate for is how very often people need that leadership support off-site um, because I think sometimes it's very difficult to reflect when you're, when you're in school and I don't mean that that should be just for leaders. I think it's something that we should all maybe think about really. Um, but especially when your door is getting knocked constantly and you're trying to have those reflective thoughts and discussions, it is very difficult. So the projection of strength is necessary. The interpretation of what we believe a leader in terms of strength to be is an interesting one. But I also think that there's a piece of work that I've just done recently with with a group of um with a group of staff across the trust that I'm working with, and one of the things that we we looked at in great detail was how different um different skill sets um across leaders were misinterpreted. So, for instance, one of the heads you know talked very openly and very movingly about the fact that you know he felt quite vulnerable most days and felt like actually he you know he was very honest and open with the staff 
staff on the other hand reported the fact that they felt that he wasn't open and honest at all so so it, it's really interesting you know when you're in leadership despite your best efforts sometimes there are those misinterpretations on the ground and i'm not saying that that's always somewhere to lay blame or fault but you know inherently it is a very difficult position to be in when you're trying to project strength trying to be open as well and things are open to misinterpretation so I think we need to unpick that relationship a little bit more um, in terms of what we expect from our leaders. But also, do you know, what I think the key to this is, is looking at middle leaders because they have to do both. And and I think we could learn a lot more from middle leaders and how they manage that, how they keep the relationship strong on the ground and how they're very visible within, within all their areas. But similarly, they've still got to lead as well. And I think speaking to middle leaders a lot um, and understanding how they do those things and what the most effective ways to do that are, is really where we need to go in terms of research and development and understanding a lot more. Yeah, I can I can agree with you more there. Um, a lot of middle leaders that I speak to, uh, again, you know, are driving um, the staff wellbeing strategy as an example. Um, you know, a sort of coordinating CPT. You know, there's a lot lot going on there, and I think support for middle leaders is is vitally important. I, I definitely would agree with you there. I was just thinking of a. a um, uh, sort of an encounter that I had with a with a head teacher um, a couple of months ago now, and it sort of touched on the point of showing sort of strength through vulnerability as well, which you picked up, Mike. There and uh, the head teacher said to me that we're looking to you know launch a, a sort of new revised staff wellbeing strategy and actually do it properly. You know, get staff mm. involved, um, staff voice, and and shape this for the next three years. And that head teacher said to me, I've, I've written a blog um, about how my mental health has been affected during the last 12 months as a head teacher, the, the ups and downs, the, the waves um, over the last 12 months. And she was very passionate about sharing that with her staff uh, to, to say, look, you know, um, I can appear strong sometimes and I will and I'll lead our school. But other times I have had moments where I've needed support and to reach out as well. And this this blog, you know, almost brought me to tears, really. It was it was such a, a powerful uh, piece. And I'm hoping that um, well, the head teachers has said that I can share that, for, you know, far and wide as we go forward. But it, when that was shared with staff in a staff meeting, the, the, the impact that had and you know, how staff saw that as a sense of strength from the head teacher. It was remarkable, really. Um, and it really blew me, it blew me away. So I think that's a real, um, really important point and, and more thinking to be done around that. Um, thanks, for your, thanks for your views on that, Mike. Um, on to another question then. Um, this one, would you, what would you like to see in schools um, to, to have in place to support men's mental health and well-being? So, you know, what, what type of things can schools think about um, and consider and approaches to, to support support men's mental health? Time. Time is, I think, the most useful and precious thing in many different respects. Um, you ask anybody who works in any school, and it's certainly the number one thing that comes back, you know, in terms of what would you need more of, and it's, it's time, um, whether that's used for planning or, you know... Um, uh, interaction, you know, support, whatever it is. But time is really key. And i tell you why, and, and I will expand on it. I'm not just going to leave it there. Um, time is one of those things, I think, for, for people that instead of putting towards a menu of, you know, let's do sport, let's do yoga, let's do baking, let's do this, let's do that, and being prescriptive about, about that, we need to encourage more autonomy. And I think when you give people time and it's built in, then they find all incredible ways of of, of connecting with different areas that are beneficial to the to their health and, and, to, and to other people in the setting too. One of the things that I trialed recently, um, which was really interesting, was that we built in an extra 45 minutes um, a week um, where it was non-contact time for certain members of staff. Um, and we trialed it with both males and females, but the male data was really interesting because what came back was that routinely what would happen is that if that time arose and they didn't know that anybody else um, uh, was on that same contact, non-contact time. They would just spend that time by themselves. Whereas the, the female groups in, in the four of the schools actually actively sought to find out if anybody else was free on those times. But what was really interesting was that when we did start to join people up within those non-contact time, 
and people reported doing all sorts of things. You know, they went on a coffee together. Um, they they caught up and, and spoke about a number of different things. They shared some thoughts and they shared some resources, all of those things. So I think there has to be a little bit of structure that's, you know, that's given to people. You give them free time, of course, and you don't necessarily need to prescribe how it works. But I think giving people a structure to work in and saying, actually, you know, there are people that we can link you up with and, and things that you can do is really, really interesting and useful. Because I think that actually there's this kind of... Um, within education sometimes we 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 need that we need that structure and support i've seen it recently in wales when we're moving towards the curriculum for wales now you know whatever you think of the curriculum for wales one of the biggest things is is that autonomy is essentially being returned to, to the profession and what's really interesting is some people's reaction is very much well hang on a minute i need to be told what to do <laughs> so you know actually sometimes even though we crave that autonomy and, and that time and that freedom we still need a little bit of directive. So it was interesting in that research that actually one thing we needed to do was give people free time, but still structure it in some way. So it's kind of not going completely all the way yet and just holding back on that and giving them a bit more time with some structure in. The other thing I'd say as well is that one thing I would really like to see more of, as well as the time aspect, one thing I'd really like to see more of is external elements coming into schools. And it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a counsellor coming in or um, a mental health practitioner or anything like that. But just other people from different areas of the community. Um, I know a school that works really well with the chaplain community, for example. Um, and most of the staff there say, you know, I'm not religious whatsoever. However, sitting down and talking with them and just, you know, having a chat with them does me the world of good. Um, and it's and it's something that I really appreciate. And it's it doesn't cost anything. So there's there's all of those different external community um, factors that we can bring in. And I think we need to do much better jobs of, you know, utilising retired teachers. Um, people you know within professions that exist within our community we, we need a much more community-based focus the last thing i'll say just just briefly i am greatly greatly concerned about the lack of ability for people to be honest about the things that they're finding difficult and how it often gets translated into accountability measures and one of the things that I am often concerned about and speak quite, quite lengthily with leaders about is that we can't in one breath say we want you to fill in a staff survey where we want you to be honest about workload and then A, not have it followed up or anything change or B, you know, actually if you sit down and have a conversation with that person they say I'm really struggling with my workload that then turns into a conversation about capability. Well, that if that's the only process that people go to to support people, then there's something wrong, isn't there? So we need to think really carefully about really building out our first response to staff stress and distress, and then thinking about capability as an entirely different matter. Um, because quite often it's our fallback and we say, oh, well, it's okay because we'll give you a support plan. You know, it's called support. So therefore, you know, they'll definitely think it's supportive. Well, <laughs> just just by nature of going on a support plan doesn't feel that supportive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whereas I understand the reason for those things, and I've been in the position where I've had to do it with people myself, I do understand the need for it. But we also need to identify a much better process. And, and that needs to be part of line management training very regularly for staff. I've just sent a load of staff in some of the um, trusts that I work with online management training, but not standard line management training where you go through all the tick lists and all the processes. There's also an emotionally literate one, which is very, very important. So it's about how we seep through those messages of well-being throughout our systems and processes and making sure that when staff do express things, we tell them all the time, don't we? Come and talk to me, come and talk to me. But then when they do come and talk to us, do staff actually have the skills and ability to respond effectively and compassionately? My answer to that is nine times out of 10, no, they don't. Not because they're not good people and they can't do it, but because they don't have the systematic response to go with their responses. Yeah, there's some real excellent points there, Mike. I think, you know, um, it's something that we certainly recommend in the work in Wales and I do around support for, for line managers and, and options and CPD opportunities for line management training and really um, embedding sort of well-being in our processes um, exactly what, what you said there. Um, it's something that I often um, speak about with, with schools is, is how do we embed well-being in the everyday of the school fabric really not, not just have um, a, a policy um, that we've we've uh, pinched off someone someone else and just put our name on it 
um, not just that we do yoga once a year, but how do we embed these practices in the everyday fabric of the school? So do we talk about well-being and support and, and stress and managing workload at induction? Do we do that on our one-to-ones, in our team meetings? Is staff well-being a standard agenda item at governor's meetings? So it's really having those conversations and working with staff to come up with some creative solutions as well. And I always find that can be very, very useful um, through any staff survey. Um, you know, ask around workload, but staff may, may really have some excellent, you know, simple things of better ways of, of doing things and adapting. Um, I, I spoke with the school recently um, around just cutting out one team meeting or staff meeting um, and putting in place a, a three or four bullet bulletin instead of that meeting. So staff were having the concise information available and it was fine uh, and clear, but it gave back staff an hour and a half of time to work on the things that would benefit them as a professional and their well-being. And that, that, that came from a staff member suggesting it. So I, I thought that was um, fantastic, really. And uh, something that I encourage um, our sort of senior leaders to, to do is, is speak with staff on um, ways of, uh, of working around, you know, working towards that well-being sort of workload and, and strategy as well. I agree. Can I just very quickly say, and as well, sorry, one thing I'd just quickly say on that, and I, I, this, I pushed out and I wrote a blog on this literally today with Oxford Union University Press. And that's not the reason I mentioned it, by the way, that wasn't a big drop in there. But it's because it's relevant. One of the problems that we have is that we, we do the same with CPD, right? And, and I've got a big problem with the way that we commission CPD. So we say, right, we're going to do some work on well-being. And what we do is we budget for one day where we get somebody in to talk about well-being. And we tick that box. I now refuse point blankly to do one day, one day um, training days. I don't do it. The reason being is because I know what happens. We get a training day in. We all talk about it. We take nothing away from it. And so one of the things I've really started to do is to say to staff, right, when you budget for CPD, also budget for an extra day where you can get cover for the key people in your school and free them up and sit down and put together a strategy on how you're going to implement that change. You sequence the change. You, you know, you make sure it's in the right order and you think about what priorities tie into that, what you're already doing. And you look towards the 12 to 18 month plan minimum. And that's how it works. So you change your CPD offer from instead of having four days of training you go one day of training and then we're going to put in reflective support coaching practice etc to really embed this and then we say actually what are the signs of this working and when are we going to move on to the next part instead of saying we've ticked that box and we've done well-being and now we expect it magically to be everywhere throughout the school it doesn't work like that so it's the same thing we've got to think about that long-term systematic response rather than just empty platitudes i think yeah, can agree more, Mike. Um, definitely, and I think I think that's a fantastic suggestion for anyone uh, listening as well to to consider and, and take away. Okay, I've got one more question uh, for you, Mike. If that's okay, um, I'm going to chip in as well. Um, but I was going to ask: it's it's Men's Health Week, and we're focusing on men's uh, men's mental health. So I was going to ask you: um, what things or activities or um, what things do you do in your life that promotes positive mental health? Uh, for you? It's a great question. I have to say this has really changed um, over the last 18 months. Um, I'll be honest. Um, I now find myself needing more and more time in the evenings to just completely rest. Um, and to the point where I probably have excluded, you know, friendships a little bit, and I'm not saying that that's a healthy thing, but it's been a conscious choice throughout the week. So now what I've tried to do is instead of come back in, go out and socialise with people, you know, feel absolutely shattered um, in the evening and not have any time to rest. I've had to really think about how well I do rest. And and what I actually started to do was I would have evenings where I'd have maybe three or four hours rest, but I wouldn't feel rested. And so actually I'd have to think about what I was doing. So now I've started to really think carefully about whether I feel that I have had some deep rest. So often now at the moment, I, 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 I can't believe I'm admitting this publicly, um, I love gardening. I'm a proper gardening nerd. And I'm not somebody that has a massive garden. And I used to take the mick out of people who used to be able to name flowers and plants and all of that. Um, but now I love it because it's just something completely different. And I don't have to think about anything else. So it's changed and I have found different interests. But similarly, what I also understand is that I now know what I need and when. So if I've got something planned in the evening, but I know I need to push that to the weekend so I've got more time, that is something I do. 
it's not excluding people or you know saying that i'm not gonna i'm gonna isolate myself but i'm very mindful of what i need and when and some days i need more interaction on the weekends sometimes i need it more in the week and i'm very mindful about how i keep my diary and and try to keep that time in so quality rest i think is really important for us to consider what about you what do you do yeah, I think that's a great point around quality rest and it's that almost conscious gear switching throughout our day as well, you know, not being on, on all the time and making sure we do rest, not just sleep, as you said, you know, taking our opportunity to switch up our activities and, and really having that rest and, and recuperation. Um, a couple of things again, like this has changed for me over um, the last, you know, few years really, but I know that sort of some some form of exercise is good for me uh, i know that it's not necessarily we need to run marathons and and do iron man and, and different things it might just be stepping outside for a 15 minute walk with my partner or with the dog or wherever it might be but I, but i know that if that starts getting squeezed out of my routine um it'll have the adverse you know effect on me and uh, you know I, I won't be you know feeling as good as i, I could be so exercise is certainly something um, that I tap into and actually looking at the research as well, men really f feel that exercise is a, is a very useful um, uh, strategy and tool to, to support positive well-being. Um, but also I'll say as well, um, using services available to, to, to myself in the workplace and previous workplaces. So uh, like an employee assistance program. Um, and there have been periods that I have picked up the phone to our employee assistance program and, and spoken to a, a counsellor just to have that different discussion, different perspective, um, a 45 minute space of time for me and that person that is confidential. Um, and it, 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 I found this a real useful strategy for me if I feel things are building up and I could do with that discussion. Where I'm better at it now is I try and be a bit pro more proactive with that reaching out to the AP um, and just talk through a few things and get some perspectives. Uh, and I find that really, really helpful. So brilliant. I think we've, um, well, we've overshot um, a, a little bit, which is, which is great. I think we've had a, um, a fantastic uh, discussion uh, this evening, Mike, and I really appreciate your time and insights. So I'm always really intrigued and take lots from you when I uh, connect with you, Mike, certainly. Um, what, what I want to do now is uh, remind everyone um, of um, some further support that is available uh, to, to people listening in. And at Education Support, we offer a free confidential uh, helpline. Um, and this is available 24-7 for staff that currently work in education and also may, may have left the profession. And that's any role within education. Um, you'll be speaking to a trained uh, counsellor. And it's, like I said, available uh, day and night, um, which is a real useful resource. So the number for that is 08000 562 uh, So that's 08000 562 Also, if you pop onto the Education Support uh, website, there will be lots of resources and information, um, uh, lots of tips and further signposting available uh, for anyone listening and onto this uh, onto this live and also the recording afterwards as well but just lastly to say thanks very much uh, mike armature again for joining me the this afternoon and thanks to everyone for tuning in and joining us um, i wish you a very pleasant evening and the rest of your week and uh, like i said education support is here um, for for educators right across the uk thanks mike thanks guys take care Take care, everyone. Thank you.